The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. Well, Priscilla, thank you so much. You covered a lot of territory in some interesting and diverse ways. But one of the questions I wanted to ask really relates to the the information you were sharing at the end about your career and and uh, really enjoyed your stories about Gloria and Dr. Jewett and Jack. And I know certainly as I think about my career, there are certainly significant people that had huge influences. So I'm going to kind of turn the tables on you. You talked about people that had mentored you and sponsored you. How do you now turn that around and do that for other people? And I think particularly with the audience that we have here, we have many people here that are in a similar position who probably have the opportunity to do that. Don't know if they've thought a lot about it, but how do you identify those people? How do you then act as a sponsor and a mentor? Well, for me, one of the things that's really important. Are we on? Can you hear me? Oh, did you? Are we working now? Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Patrick keeps me straight. He's on my team. <laughs> you bring individuals with you that uh, you identify as being strong players, and you give them exposure and opportunities. So, um, but for me, one of the things that you do as a leader is really have the responsibility of identifying talent and identifying individuals that have potential within your organization. And they may be on your team, or they may be in other parts of the organization. And at times, they could even be peers. And then, frankly, volunteering, going to them and offering ways that you can support them. On occasion, it might just be a candid conversation to say, I'd really like to help you with your career. Let's talk about that. How can I help you? What are some opportunities? What are some uh, issues or concerns that you have? And how can I support you in that regard? If you're not their boss, that's a good conversation to have. Obviously, you'll have to balance that. But if you are somewhere in the leadership chain for that individual, then that's an even easier conversation to have because you have access then to their information in terms of what are some of their areas for development. But more importantly, identifying their strengths and then, frankly, playing up those strengths and giving them opportunities, stretch assignments, giving them opportunities in terms of exposure to different things outside of their normal realm of responsibility. So those are some of the ways that I currently do uh, exactly that in terms of mentoring and being supportive, either as a sponsor or a mentor. Now, how many people in the audience are in what you would consider sort of a small or medium-sized businesses? How many? Okay, so quite a few. So my question, you, you were sharing a lot about what McKesson's doing in terms of their own health care initiatives and working with employees. But McKesson's a very, very large company. There's lots of scale mm -hmm. in a company like McKesson. What about uh, folks like those in the audience that are in more medium and small size businesses? How do they get some of those same benefits in the context of being in a much different kind of setting where you don't have that scale to accomplish some of what you're able to in a place like McKesson? There are still ways that you can actually pursue um, offerings for your employees. At times, it may be part of a consortium or a coalition, um, aggressively negotiating with insurance providers or looking at other offerings. You may not have the scale, but you still have, especially in today's environment, I would argue, you still have buying power because they are still looking for revenue streams, whether they are small, medium, or large. Um, you may then have to package your offerings a little differently. You may not have the breadth of offerings, but you can target those that would actually be the most benefit to your employee population, looking at whether it's chronic diseases or looking at other things that you could offer. So even your small or medium organization, you can still provide those benefits. They will just look differently. You know, I was touched by the story you shared about your son, and I'm certainly glad he's doing well now and yes. fully recovered from that. But it certainly does illustrate that even individuals in positions that know health care, probably have some influence in health care, can still face some of the same roadblocks that sort of the average citizen faces in that process. As you look at the health care landscape, I mean, what are the one or two things you see that could actually make a significant difference to make navigating that more more simple, making access better for individuals. It's certainly a very complicated problem, but in your view, what are some of the sort of 
more basic things that could be done to make it better? Well, two things. There could be greater standardization so that information could be accessible. As I mentioned earlier, even the uh, various treatments for particular conditions, sometimes there is significant debate because there isn't standardization of care. So if there was greater standardization of care, that information then could be more easily leveraged in terms of options that people could look at and consider in terms of treatments for themselves or for members of their family. Greater connectivity um, through IT, as we know, the stimulus package recently that was signed includes monies that will be set aside for healthcare IT. So greater connectivity between the payer, the hospital, the doctor, that too will increase mm -hmm. and leverage uh, and create greater accessibility and frankly reduce errors. Um, doing greater research yourself as an individual, um, something that candidly I had not done. Now, doing that research, though, is not easy uh, because you can go on the internet and there is just a ton of information that is available, but there are some websites that actually will help you in terms of investigating and analyzing what your options are and what should be the best approach, or just becoming more familiar with what's being debated within healthcare and what are some of the considerations to improve the healthcare system. So lots of different yeah. options. And you're but right, no the, easy task. the information out there is a bit overwhelming sometimes, it and it takes some work to just get through that. It is. Well, I want to open the floor up to our audience and see what questions you have for Priscilla, and certainly along any of the dimensions that we've talked about or others that we haven't even. Yes. And then we'll go back over here. So start here. Could everybody at the back hear the question or not? So she was sharing an experience about her husband going to the emergency room in the, for two hours, and the bill was $18,000, and if they paid it cash rather than sending it through the emergency room, they would get a 75%, or the insurance company, excuse me, 75% 75 75 reduction. reduction. So unfortunately, I'm not on that end of health care, and so I can't answer that question. Um, I understand that there are some insurance representatives here in the room actually I met one or two they might be able to help enlighten us see I believe in engaging the audience <laughs> <laughs> so and sharing the baton. I would be glad I know you're with Phillips Healthcare so would you like to respond hold on you know what Debbie would you Is grab the mic? microphone and let her use that so I we have such a long room I know it's hard to hear at the back without a uh, We'll let Debbie play, uh, carry the, Is I think he can turn it on for you, yeah. You didn't know you were going to actually be part of the program, did you, tonight? And thank you for helping me out. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, in a nutshell, I would say that um, the uh, it's such a hassle for hospitals, physicians, to deal with insurance. They find every possible way, they fight every claim they get that um, it's actually probably close, they would probably save close to that 75% by getting the cash directly from you than having to hire people who are asking and asking again and fighting with the insurance company on every count, on every claim, every lab result, every little piece of uh, care that your husband got. Um, and as sad as it is, this is, you know, the, the, in a nutshell, the answer to that question. Yeah. Now that makes a lot of sense. Let's pass the microphone over here. We had a question there, and then we'll come to we'll come back to you. Priscilla, you mentioned there there were some initiatives of cost reduction at McKesson. Uh, do you have quantifiable data that you can share? The background of my question is. In 93, I was working for a company that was doing the EDIFAC standards for health, and the cost of a healthcare transaction at that time uh, was $21, just one transaction. And with that automation using technologies, we could have brought down 
to under a dime. At the same time, that technology didn't go any forward. And today, we are still talking in this country about electronic health records. So it looks like there is a pushback on uh, just pure efficiency. So I would like to hear your experience in there. Well, I don't have the numbers with me. What I can tell you is that we have over the last three years, and it's primarily not because of, of technology, it's really managing the chronic conditions. And it has been with um, the effective use of disease management and making sure that we're uh, working and focusing on prevention. Those have been the keys for us to really drive down our costs from an employee population, less so on the use of technology. So those are really the initiatives where we are starting to see anywhere from 15 to 25 percent reduction in costs. And as we know, it's really about prevention for the most part. Great. Right up here in the front. Right here. Second row. I've worn two hats. So on the carrier side for, I'll stop at 20 years, and now I'm on the employee <laughs> benefits and risk management consulting side. So to answer your question uh, with regards to the doctor, the hospital bill, uh, it could well be that uh, they just took you down to the discounts that had already been negotiated with the hospital because uh, there are tons of articles that are out there that says that a person that's uninsured and has to pay the bill or it's not really getting the discounts that you would get that have been negotiated with hospitals. So that's number one. Uh, the other is, is it is um, known that hospital billing have duplicate errors. You've had a, a pill for $1.50, sorry, pharmaceutical, but you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Pardon? If you go over, if you go over the billing statement, you'll see tons of, you know, errors and what have you. So that's one issue to answer yours. The other is, is that there have been several journals, uh, medical journals that have been published around um, efficiency, uh, saying that as much as 30% can be uh, cut in terms of cost just by virtue of electronic records and what have you. Mm -hmm. So that's really why we're seeing the push in terms of uh, cost. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Go ahead there, and then we'll come right back in front again. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of health care is a, a large bucket. Uh, and I hear statistics about, uh, you know, every day there's uh, so many millions of Americans turning age 65. There's over 80 million in the next five years that are going to be in that senior mm -hmm. category. You provide a, a broad spectrum of services. Where do you see the greatest opportunities in that marketplace in terms of services for seniors? From a business perspective? From a business perspective. You're looking for business opportunities? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'd say a couple of things come to mind. Um, home care, home health care would be one. Uh, Long-term care would be another. Those would be the two that most immediately come to mind. Um, as you look at the aging population and the baby boomers and some of the things that they will need on an ongoing basis from age 65 and older. The realities are that's when there is the greatest need for mm -hmm. medical support. That's usually when you have the most significant either uh, illnesses or injuries or traumas. And so I would say really in, in those two in particular, long-term care and home health care. Welcome. Uh, President Obama is working on a single payer or universal health care, his team, mm -hmm. and most likely it will pass what would it impact your company, or are you working to help the, the government? I'm going to make her answer that nod of her head first. So yeah. you're not necessarily convinced it will pass. Speak to that yeah. in addition to kind of his question. So um, I will speak as Priscilla, uh, <laughs> because McKesson really hasn't uh, finalized their position on this. So we're still in data collection mode. Uh, what I will tell you from my perspective, just knowing our country, and I was having this conversation about the single payer uh, position during the reception, I'm not sure that our country will buy into a uh, single payer that is managed solely by the government. Secondly, I'm not sure that the government is equipped to manage being the single payer for health care for our country. So for those two reasons, I'm not really sure that that is going to pass. Having said that, there are over 47 million uninsured individuals in the country as of the data that I saw two weeks ago. So we have to do something in this country to make health care more accessible and more affordable. 
it could be, I keep hearing that uh, we're compared to, or the plans are being compared to what Canada and Australia have in place, which would be more like a single payer. But then you have plans that Germany and Belgium have that is a hybrid model. And I could see a hybrid model being in place here in the US so that there is some form of basic insurance that's available for everyone, but not necessarily a single payer for every medical service or every medical treatment that occurs in the US. Um, I don't have, obviously, the answer, but I don't think Obama's plan will pass as it's currently devised. I think there will be significant edits and modifications, and I think it will take more than maybe even one term before we will actually see something like that pass. That's my opinion. Good. I'd like to ask you how you think McKesson is uh, differentiating itself uh, from its biggest competitors? Well, three things. Um, so our biggest competitors are Cardinal and, and ABC, if you're not familiar with the space, Marisource Bergen. And how we differentiate ourselves is not only our offerings, um, because we have a package of offerings that, frankly, they don't have in terms of all of our technologies as well as our distribution. But we also have services that they don't offer, that we offer. Without going into a lot of detail, it's, it's really those two that act as the primary differentiator in the marketplace. Um, some of the other uh, components might be considered to commoditize, but those are really the two that are the most significant differentiators in the marketplace. I think we have time for one more question, if we have someone else in the audience that would like to. Right over here. The Wall Street Journal reported this morning that one out of every four four-year-old children is grossly overweight. One out of every three four-year-old ch child is uh, children of um, American Indian descent are grossly overweight. So what role does um, McKesson Corporation or what do you re recommend for other corporations to do about this tragic situation? Obesity, in my opinion, very similar to um, diabetes and, and other things, really tie into prevention. And this is early education, early identification around changes of behaviors, um, a, around preventative measures, um, assessments. Those are the kinds of things, as I mentioned, that we're doing with McKesson employees. Not that I'm saying McKesson employees are obese, but understanding what the chronic conditions are, understanding what the conditions are that really can have an adverse impact on health. And as long as we can implement, as we know, there is, as part of the stimulus, and I forget the exact um, definition, but it's S-CHIP, so the State Child Insurance Plan, I think that's what it's called. Um, so that there is funding for individuals that are low income, primarily focused on children. So having said that, I think it's all about prevention, early identification, and then changing of the behaviors, first and foremost. So we can have the insurance, but we really need to prevent it. And that is around the early education and assessment. That's my mantra. And clearly that has very, very long-term implications on health care in the country because of the long-term health impacts of Absolutely. obesity, particularly in children. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, Priscilla, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure having you. You can watch this or listen to the podcast on either iTunes or YouTube University, as well as all of our other speakers that we've had over the last several years uh, are available. You can also on those sites see speakers from other places on campus as well. Sandra Day O'Connor just spoke at the law school about a week ago, and so her speech is on there. But it's been a pleasure having you. We've learned so much about a very complicated part of the world, and we thank you for being a part of our evening. Well, thank you for having thank me. You. And thank you all.